Welcome back to Media 7. The Auckland Art Fair has been and gone and, according to director Jennifer Buckley, emerged unmolested by the recession. Clearly, she told us, nothing dispels a sense of economic gloom better than a little cultural investment. Although the fair was all about the art, its guest lecturer was an economist. That was Don Thompson, whose book The $12 Million Stuffed Shark used Damien Hirst's famous or infamous work as the touchstone for a story less about art than about money and manipulation. The basis on which art has been bought and sold for the past decade or two was also the topic of a high-powered debate in New York earlier this year on the moot, the art market is less ethical than the stock market. Debate organiser Robert Rosencrantz pointed out that media star Hearst played a key role in manipulating the market price for his work by forming a consortium to buy it. He said financial markets used to do the same thing. I'd like now to turn back to the stock market. Um, in the 1920s, there were syndicates of sophisticated investors who would quietly accumulate stock and would then sell the stock back and forth to each other at ever-increasing prices in order to give the unsuspecting public the sense that there was a bullion and lively market. When the public uh, came in, the insiders would quietly sell. Legendary New York gallery owner Richard Feigen took up that theme. This all really began in the middle 80s when art became monetized by the press and the financial institutions. Banks lent money on art and auction houses lent money to buy art. Thousands of people became involved. Billions of dollars changed hands. For the negative, New York magazine art critic Jerry Saltz was having none of it. The talk about the market hollows out Art. It takes your eyes off the prize and you're stuck talking about a red herring, something that to be perfectly honest, not one person in this room, not them, <laughs> got into the art world to do. Each one of them is here because they love art. Sadly, the capacity audience did go for the argument that the art market is indeed less ethical than the stock market. But does it matter? Does any of this change what art is and why anyone does it? Should we focus on the people who buy art or on those who make it? Joining me now are three wise men, art critic and writer Warwick Brown, Hamish Keith, whose guise as a cultural curmudgeon has never quite obscured his love for art and what it means, and critic, consultant and curator Hamish Coney. Welcome to you all. Hello. Warwick, let's start with the art fair. Um, if it went off so well at a time when it's hard to get people to open their wallets for anything, what should we make of that? I think we should make of it that art is a fairly resilient commodity in a recession uh, and that perhaps it's not uh, an item of commerce quite as much as some in the media would like to have us believe. New Zealand is not New York. We don't have anyone quite at the manipulative level of Damien Hirst in this country. I think there's a greater awareness of quality here rather than uh, being seen to own the right art and mix with the right people, that sort of thing. So uh, we haven't really taken quite the bath that the top end of the American market has taken. Uh, but the other part of it is I think that in difficult times where one is not sure whether to put one's money into real estate or into shares or bonds. The art market could be seen to be a safer place to put one's money. Now, I've never advocated investing in art, but uh, if I had a whole lot of spare cash at the moment and didn't quite know what to do with it, I think buying New Zealand art wouldn't be such a bad idea. I must say my experience at the art fair, which I greatly enjoyed, was that most of the works, with a couple of exceptions that, uh, that I really liked, I had no show at all of buying. Who are the people who buy art, particularly the higher end stuff? Well, I think uh, all walks of life buy art. There's a, there's a whole host of younger artists coming through whose work is quite affordable for the average person. Uh, and I, that's, that's been the case ever since New Zealand contemporary art got rolling in the 1960s. One of the uh, most active collectors in the 50s and 60s was a gentleman called Kim Wright, a lovely man, and he made his living working on the wharves. Hmm. Hamish Keith, um, 
Would it be correct to say that you regard this talk of the art market as a distraction from what art ought to be about and what ought to be talked about? Yeah, absolutely. A complete distraction. It's like you know, addressing the global crisis by wondering how the second car market's doing. It doesn't fit. It's just a. <clears throat> it's typical, I think, of the media irrelevance uh, when it comes to matters of the cultural sector. Could we just, for a moment, reflect on how big that is? Um, and I get these figures, by the way, from Statistics New Zealand. The cultural sector in New Zealand employs 7% of everybody employed. That's 126,000 people in full paid time, full time paid work, working in the sector which roughly nurtures, nourishes, or, or nurses uh, the national imagination. Now, compare that with tourism, which employs 5.5% of all paid employment. So we're, we're talking here about something rather larger than people who buy stuffed sharks, or the cultural equivalent to Bernie Madoff's Ponzi schemes. In fact, what we're talking about here is real people with real mortgages and real problems and real families, and they too are facing recession. Just one example. There was a major film being made in Wellington last year. Its total budget was $150 million. It spent $50 million of that. Now, that was money that came from somewhere else and was spent here. It was a V8 race. Everybody was enormously pleased about that. It would have made the front page of the papers. It got hit by the global credit crunch. It went down, and with it went 700 jobs. 700 jobs of creative, talented New Zealanders. Now, that's what we're talking about, not whether somebody can afford to buy something from the art fair. And it kind of makes me really annoyed when we trivialise, uh, if you like, a, a really rather large part of our economy. The contribution to the GDP, the latest figures, are close to $4 billion from the cultural sector. And now, yet the person presented <coughs> to the press by the Art Fair organisers was Don Thompson, who was, you know, he's an economist, he was all about the market. Was that a poor choice? Well, I think it's a poor, I think it's a poor choice, but, you know, I mean, everybody likes amusement, there's bread and circuses. Everybody gets a big laugh out of Damien Hirst and the coterie of English dealers and advertising agents who invented Britpop. But what's it got to do with the real thing? The real thing, the real question we need to ask is, will we come out of this recession, a real recession, with the national imagination intact and operating? I think that's what we should be talking about, not how well the art market's doing. So we should be talking about artists rather than this one relatively small part of the sector you're talking about, well, which is the yeah, art market. Yeah, it's a larger, I mean, the writers too. I mean, there are, you know, according to um, the last census, there are 100 uh, and I think 1,142 full-time authors. That's not journalists, that's authors, people writing books. Well, when publishers are halving their lists, when book pages and publications are shrinking, those people's I income and, and occupation is really under threat. So we have to ask, should something be done about that? Now, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, confronted the Great Depression in America, they set up the Federal Arts Program to make sure that America came out of the other side of that with some good things intact. And almost every major American artist of the 20th century took part in that program. They commissioned 500,000 public works of art. They set up theatres and galleries in towns which had never had theatres and galleries. They commissioned books, plays, films. Now, we can't do that, obviously, but we could do something close. Why, why can't we do that? What's changed uh, between now and the 1930s where it was acceptable to set up a public uh, artworks program well, what's who, whose fruits are still there to be seen? Well, exactly. But what's changed about it is that you know, the media never talks about the real problem. It just gets blindsided, if you like, by Damien Hirst, that is, floating shark. Do you agree with that, Hamish Coney? Do, do, do we talk about money so much we've left art out of the conversation? Well, I think that in most cases, unlike uh, if, you, if you refer to art as an industry, and for, I guess for the sake of this discussion we do, is that art is a, a commodity, as Warwick called it, that, whose primary objective to exist wasn't to be uh, an item of commerce. You know, an artist doesn't sit there. A bright young um, you know, 18-year-old coming out of university doesn't think, uh, I'm going to be an artist because I'm going to make a truckload of money. Um, although well, I have, I have them, well, I have read that, that, that you know, <laughs> 10 years ago they were saying that an MFA was the new MBA in New York. But uh, you know, there's been a lot, of, a lot of water under the bridge since then. No, I think that all these conversations that, that talk simply about art in the context of money miss the point for the reason that art exists. And it's a kind of a fallacy that the, the media relentlessly persists with. The only time art, or I'm talking about painting, or I'm talking about the visual arts, the only time that ever makes the front page of the paper is when a record price is achieved. It's just about money. 
Goldie sells for four hundred thousand dollars. That's front page news. So what other stories? Could, Pritchard, what other stories could there be Venice outside? Not news. Outside the ghetto of the art section. Well, here's a story. Seven hundred creative New Zealanders lost their jobs when a film went down. Has there been any mention of that? No. There was an item in the newspaper about some people who expected to be extras had to shave their beards off. Now that's as, as close as it got. If that had actually been, uh, you know, a rug manufacturer or a football sock maker then that would have been front page story. 700 jobs lost. 700 talented jobs lost. Well, can I step in with a, a personal hobby horse, uh, which is that every day of the week in our major cities and in m many of the smaller centres as well, there are really excellent art shows going on the wall and the media are not writing about them. The New Zealand Herald has a arts page once a week where the indefatigable Terry McNamara tries to get some sort of a take on what's going on, but he can only scratch the surface. Meanwhile, every day of the week, we get a sports section in the paper, a great big sports section, which tells us about obscure football games and grounds in Morrinsville or whatever, <laughs> and repetitive pictures of league players tackling each other and, and falling down and so on. Now, I'm, I'm not knocking New Zealand sport, but I'm saying that, exactly as Hamish has said, that New Zealand art is a big operation. There are a lot of artists making a lot of art, and the media are not covering well, that. Well, if I could jump in here, here's an outrage for you. A, a black cap gets a base salary of $100,000 a year and a $6,000 match fee for a test match. An all black gets a base salary of $180,000 a year and a $7,000 match fee. We send two artists to the Venice Biennale. They have to spend a year and a half working on the work there. They have to spend time at the Venice Biennale and they get a flat fee of 10 grand. Now that's outrageous. See, the one lot of money comes from Rupert Murdoch and the other lot uh, comes from the government. Uh, is that not a difference? Uh, well, the government's what? It's all of us. Yeah. In fact, you know, if we are going to expect people to go there and represent us, and actually, there, there seems to be some point in that. I mean, times when I've wondered if there was any point in it. But if you are going to ask people to go and represent their country somewhere, they can, surely you can put on at least a level playing field. Hamish Coney, the, the one thing that strikes me, and we've, we've all apparently agreed that the media do a dreadful job with art, I, I wonder whether there are many new voices. I mean, you're notable for being under 40. There aren't... Uh, the, actually, I'm not under 40. Oh, well, but, you're, uh, look, you're, look, <laughs> thank you're looking you, Russell. good. Uh, but I love you too. No, but <laughs> where, where are the new voices and the new ideas? Because we, we know the names of the major art critics and the major publications, and they've been doing that well, for decades. I, I think that um, one of the things that is a little bit frustrating is that um, the New Zealand contemporary art scene is really exploding with talent. And I think that the, for the first time in, in the history of New Zealand art, with one or two notable exceptions, Francis Hodgkins back in the day, New Zealand contemporary artists can realistically expect to have a national and international career. It wasn't so long ago that every single New Zealand practicing artist earned their living from something other than being an artist. Toss Wollaston was a ruling salesman is, now. Is there any parallel there to say what um, musicians have been able to do uh, in taking more control of their own work and, and the way that, that it's able to be presented and sold? I mean, the internet seems to have played a big role there. Is that happening with young, young contemporary visual artists? I think that, that you know, the, the power of the internet for um, uh, an isolated culture like New Zealand applies to the visual arts like it applies to anything else, whether it be wine, filmmaking, tourism. It is a great link to the world. Um, I think that what we have in New Zealand now is a different kind of attitude. Um, I think that young artists expect to be able to have a career. Now, it's not going to be a realistic expectation for all of them, but it is notable now that there is more ambition in young artists, and I think that's probably a good thing. Um, I think that's also because the New Zealand discourse in the visual arts is not just confined to defining a New Zealand national identity. I mean, that's a, that's well, a, that's a conversation. Actually, I, I was, I was you know. going to discuss, because we, we, with hindsight, we can all, all easily enough go back and look at the artists of previous decades and say they defined their time in this way. Mm. In which way do you think the young contemporary artists now, who maybe don't get as much exposure as they should, how are they defining their age? For New Zealand, young New Zealand artists, there is some sense that they are in fact losing uh, their identity. If I selected 10 
young artists from a, randomly around the world in their late 20s and early 30s, and I said, pick the New Zealander in 2009, you probably wouldn't be able to. The, the art that is produced in New Zealand in the main is not dissimilar from the art that's produced in Australia, from Brazil, Japan, Mexico, you know, India. Um, we live in a kind of a global consciousness and artists are seeking to plug into that. And in some ways you can argue that it makes the art weaker because when you look at the art of the past New Zealand, that struggle to, to define a New Zealand identity resulted in some extraordinarily powerful art. In the main, though, that only art only spoke to us. What, what do you make of that, Warwick? The, the idea that, that young artists, young New Zealand artists now perhaps are more international, but that may be a weakness. My belief is that New Zealand's isolation has not necessarily always been a bad thing. The fact that our artists perhaps have only been able to see work secondhand or have missed out on, on um, trendy things that have happened overseas can sometimes mean that they, they do look closer to home and they do produce work which is more meaningful for us in New Zealand. Hey, Mr. Keith, last word to you on this theme of New Zealand identity um, and well, how important it is in art and whether it should be publicly fostered. Well, uh, it's critical, but you can't publicly foster it. It happens, and it happens inevitably, those little or large finger marks that we leave on things we make. They're all about where we are and who we are. Now, you can't define that by committee. You can't define that by critic. You can't announce this is the way it will look. I think that uh, uh, Hamish Coney is partly right, but at, at the end of the day, probably won't be right. That there will be those marks. I'm interested in Warwick's book, 100 Artists Who Appeared Since 2000. It's incredible. There's something going on. There's a conversation going on amongst those 100 people which has some common themes to it. I can't say what they are, but they're there. Well, we'll see, what it, see how it looks in 20 years' time. And one last thing I, I wouldn't mind pointing out, actually, is that uh, that uh, cultural industries figure you quoted includes journalists. Um, now... Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take ten out there. Yes. <laughs> uh, now, love him or loathe him, the American wit PJ O'Rourke has helped shape the style of modern political commentary. Simon Pound caught up with him during a flying visit to address Auckland's great and good. First up, uh, let's talk about your, your time at Rolling Stone, um, where you made your mark as a writer. What was it that you were doing for them? For most of the time that I was there, I was the sole foreign correspondent. It was just wonderful. I just bounced around the world, going from one hellhole to another uh, and making fun of everything. <laughs> the idea is to point a finger at human folly. Uh, I would never uh, go someplace and, uh, and make fun of a mudslide that had killed 600 Peruvian villagers, you know. I might make fun of the disastrous relief benefits in the wake of that mudslide. Um, but uh, I was always looking for some sort of problem that had been caused by people and that people could presumably stop causing anytime they chose. And we have to remember, it's not just a financial crisis that's out there. You know, there's Iraq, and there's the war in Afghanistan, there's North Korea, there's Darfur. I mean, there's Pakistan producing more history than it can consume locally, you know? I mean, if, if, <laughs> I mean, Joe Jerk, down the road from me in America, him with all the cars up on blocks in his front yard, he falls behind his mortgage payments, and the economy of Iceland explodes. <laughs> I'm missing a few pieces of this puzzle myself. I don't know. The, the writing you did that brought uh, humour and personal perspective to um, you know, events that previously may have been uh, treated in a very dry way, was that new? I don't think there was much of it going on at that time. There was a, a tendency to treat great events um, with a deep and serious and earnest tone that great events require, uh, uh, and uh, which is nonsense. I mean, great events like small events happen to ordinary people. And I always felt that my job uh, in, in covering these events, great and small, was be the re representative of the ordinary person, to, to get the worm's eye view on this. You know, my job is, is to make fun of politics, but after 39 years of making fun of politics, I have realized that I am enjoying myself about as much as a bear getting a bikini wax. Uh, I, I, <laughs> See, long term, there's only one thing that gives me hope as a right winger, and that's the left wing. You know, it, it, I mean, back in the States, it's going to be hard to do a worse job of running America than the Republicans did, but the Democrats can do it if anybody can. Uh, that kind of scepticism is something that is perhaps 
the role of the satirist and the role of the journalist where they overlap. Uh, do we see enough of it? Not in nearly our enough. Yeah. Not nearly enough. The the the, the role of journalist as a, a, a skeptical observer was predominant when journalism was a trade. If you grew up in a blue collar neighborhood and you didn't want to get up early in the morning and lift heavy things, and you liked books, you had two choices. Uh, you could go into the church uh, or you could go into journalism. And so the newsrooms of the world were populated by regular guys. A few of them had been to college, many had not. Then sometime in the 50s and 60s and so on, uh, with the rise of journalism school, journalism began, began to be defined as speaking truth to power. Well, no, I mean, we might occasionally speak facts to the public if we're very good. Truth to power, indeed. Bringing politicians in to run Wall Street is like saying, Dad burned dinner, let's get the dog to cook. <laughs> Politics is going to take over the car industry. I can predict the result, a lightweight, compact vehicle with a small carbon footprint using sustainable alternative energy. When I was a kid, we called it a bike. Ronald Reagan summed up our problem in one sentence. Reagan said the nine most frightening words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. I always stayed away from interviewing uh, uh, important people on, on, on the basis that, that they didn't get to be important by being stupid enough to tell the truth to some random reporter who wandered in off the street. Obama's not going to suddenly say, just between you, me, and NBC, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're going to uh, nuke North Korea. Economic freedom is the freedom we exercise most often and to the greatest extent. Freedom of speech is important if you've got anything to say. I've checked on the internet, nobody does. <laughs> freedom of belief is important if you believe in anything. I've watched cable TV, I can't believe it. Freedom of assembly is important if you have an assembly to go to the way we do. But most people go to the mall, and at the mall they exercise economic freedom. With the use of humour, uh, it also is something you can use to democratise big ideas, and that's something that uh, you, you've used to great effect uh, on matters like environmental politics and also economic politics. What's at play there? Well, exactly. That's exactly the purpose of humor, is to bring it down to human scale and to try and take what people are saying, what people are passing off as huge ideas, and, and, and make them comprehensible. And when they become comprehensible, they often become rather comic. Think about the last time you were broke. Now, how'd it go with spending your way out of that, huh? <laughs> Cures worse than the disease. Thank you. That's all I know. Um. Simon Pound there with PJ O'Rourke. And that wraps up this week's show. Thank you to our banking panellists, Tim Hunter, Andrew Campbell and Bernard Hickey, and to our arts panellists, Warwick Brown, Hamish Keith and Hamish Coney. And thank you for watching. We'll be back with Media 7 at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye.